Hello everybody, welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. Now I know in the last video I may have made you guys a little bit depressed when I started talking about force reduction systems, especially when it came to wrenches. Wrenches, again, one of the students most hated topics, but we have to be aware of it because it's a professor's best tool in lowering the midterm or the final average. So if you guys understand wrenches, you're good. Now you guys may be sad from last video, but don't worry, I'm here to cheer you guys up today because today marks a very special event in this course. And that is we're taking 3D, 3D everything, 3D vectors, 3D moments, and we're banishing it to the shadow realm. We'll never see it again, at least for the rest of this course. Now you guys may be saying, wait, what? <laughs> How can we just get rid of 3D? Well, the secret is this. If you guys are good engineers, you will always learn to be able to design everything in two dimensions. Designing things in two dimensions allows for us to do a lot of very simplistic calculations, which leads to a very efficient design. Now, there, of course, there are going to be some instances where we have to design in 3D, but as you guys will see, the majority of design can actually be done in two dimensions. The whole goal of this first half of the course was to teach you guys about forces and moments. And at this point, you guys are experts. You know forces both in 2D and 3D, and you guys know moments both in 2D and 3D. So now we're going to focus on the actual purpose of this course, and that is engineering statics, or basically we are going to start figuring out the loads on actual structures. So we're going to talk about beams, we're going to talk about trusses, and other structures that we actually see in reality. Now this is nice because the stuff that we are going to start learning in the second half of the course it's actually going to be applicable for real life design. As a structural engineer, I use what we are going to learn now and in the next couple videos every day, and especially on the research side of things too. So everything we start learning now has an actual purpose, which I find is great. The best way I find students learn is when they can actually visualize what's happening. And not only can I give you pictures of kind of the situation we're doing in with my PowerPoint clip art, but I can show you actual real life pictures too. And you guys can start going, ah, I understand what's going on. So this is when the course becomes more fun in my opinion, because we're actually doing real engineering. Now, before we get into analyzing those kind of structures, beams, trusses, we have to do a bit of kind of fundamentals. And there's two fundamental things we need to learn. The first one is what we're covering today, which is distributed loads. And the second one is going to be support conditions, which is the topic of the next video. Once we master those two things, we are good to go and start designing whatever we want, basically. So let's jump into the first one, which is distributed loads. So before we've always talked about forces as single vectors. Now, typically we actually call these point loads and they do exist in real life. If one beam is on another beam like this, well, this is going to create a point load. However, there are some loads that act over a distance. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, what exactly would these be? Well, the number one distributed load that we as engineers deal with is you, people. So if we look at this bridge right here, we see that we have a bunch of people that constantly go across this bridge. Now each person can be represented as a single force, but if we like there's so many people in that area, it's actually better to analyze it as a distributed load. So if this was my beam here or my bridge, my load's gonna look something like this, where it's distributed all the way throughout the length of the beam. Now, the question for us is, how exactly do we analyze this? If we had point loads here, you guys are saying that's no problem. I know exactly what to do with point loads. But what do we do with these distributed loads? Well, we are actually going to do something very simple. Now, it looks really bad, I'm not gonna lie. It looks like garbage, but we are actually going to make it very simple because every distributed load can be replaced with one point load at a specific location. So if I had this case here where I had a uniformly distributed load, I can actually convert this into an equivalent point load located at a very specific distance from the edge. And we can do this with all distributed loads. Now you guys are saying, Clayton, that looks sexy. I take my complex situation, make it simpler, and then I can actually analyze it with everything I learned before the midterm or the first half of this course. And that's exactly what we want. That's all of engineering. We take very complex situation as engineers and we make it simple so that we can analyze it. So let's get into how exactly do we do that? How exactly do we figure out this point load as well as where it acts? Well, unfortunately to do this, we need a little bit of calculus. Now it's just a little bit. I know when I said calculus, you guys may have been scared, may have ran out of the room. 
Come back, relax, it's going to be fine. Just a little bit of calculus. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to analyze a general case where we have a beam with a distributed load and the distributed load is a function of the length of the beam because as we see as we go across the beam the distributed load starts to change. So if we want to analyze this the first thing that we are going to do is we're going to take our beam and we are going to cut it into a bunch of finite slices. And you're saying Clayton what exactly does this mean? Well it means rather than analyzing the beam as a whole I'm going to analyze this little chunk of the beam. Now the first part is pretty simple. We know that there is going to be distributed load acting on this chunk, but we also have to define a distance. So here our distance is an infinitesimal slice, which we are going to call dx. Now dx here is so thin that the distributed load acting on top of it can be treated as uniform or constant. This allows us to figure out the force on this particular slice. It's simply going to be the area of that distributed load. So it's gonna be our distributed load w, multiplied by the thickness of the slice dx and this is going to give us our infinitesimal force df so we're basically taking the distributed load case and we're converting it into a case where we have a single force now keep in mind that we just took a little slice of this beam if we want to consider the whole beam we actually have to integrate over the entire length so if I want the complete load on this beam, which I called FR, or my resultant force, I'm simply going to integrate DF. Now, what does this mean? Well, we know that DF is simply our distributed load, WX, multiplied by DX. So in the end, our point load, F, is going to be the integral of our distributed load over the length of the beam. Now, you guys may be looking at this and saying, wait a second, I know a little bit of integration here. Clayton, you're not sneaking anything by me. This is simply the area of the distributed load. It's actually that simple. If you have a distributed load, in order to find the magnitude of that point load you're converting it to, it's simply going to be the area of the distributed load. So there's the first question. What is the magnitude of that point load? Well, it's just going to be the area of our distributed load. The second question is, where exactly does it act? Well, the force actually acts at something called the centroid of the load. Now, the centroid of the load is a big fancy word, but basically for you guys, I know that you guys are probably more familiar with things like center of mass. There is a point on this clicker where if I hold it, it's not going to tip either way. Now I'm terrible at balancing, so of course this is not going to work, but you guys know what I'm saying. Now this point where it balances equally on both sides, that is the centroid. And you guys are saying, all right, I understand what it is. How do I calculate it? Well, I'm not going to show you. <laughs> and the reason why is because centroids becomes a very complex topic. And this is actually something we cover at the very end of the course. So one of the last two videos that I'm going to show you guys actually focuses in on centroids. So we're going to come back to the idea of a centroid later. Now you guys are saying, well, if I don't know a centroid, how am I going to deal with distributed loads? Well, luckily for us, we only really deal with two types of distributed loads in engineering, and they're very simple. So we can solve them right here, right now, and we actually don't need any complex math. The first one is a rectangular distributed load. This is the most common one. As engineers, if we were to deal with a building, and we know that people are in that building, we always treat it as a nice, uniformly distributed load, so it's going to look like a rectangle. Now you guys may be saying, Clayton, I know what a rectangle is, but I'm not really sure what you mean. Let's take a look. So a rectangular distributed load, if this was my beam and it had length L, a rectangular distributed load is going to look something like this. So it's nice and uniform across the top. So notice that my distributed load function, Wx, it's actually just equal to a constant W because it doesn't change over the length of the beam. Now for this type of distributed load, what we're going to do is we are going to convert it to a single point load located at a distance. So again, we know that there's going to be a single point load that represents this distributed load. And what we talked about in the last slide is the magnitude of this load is always equal to the area of the distributed load. So if we look at this right here, the width of the distributed load is going to be L because it acts over the length of the beam. And the height of the distributed load is going to be W. So if we're looking at this and it's a rectangle, well, it's just going to be base times height, or in this case, it's going to be W times L. And this will make sense in terms of units. So again, I don't include units because we got the Americans out there that are kind of doing their own thing, and I don't want to confuse them. But distributed loads will have units of newtons per meter or something like pounds per feet. 
Now, if we take something like that and multiply it by a distance, in this case L, what happens is we cancel out the denominator and we end up with just units of either newtons or pounds, something like that. So in mathematics, it also makes sense. So this is great, but some of you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, this is only the first piece of the puzzle. Where's the second piece? Don't hold out on me. Well, don't worry. As you guys may have guessed for a rectangle, the center or the centroid or the center of mass is actually right in the center. So for a rectangular distributed load, this force is actually going to be placed right at the midpoint of that triangle. Again, this is something very intuitive and you guys can easily figure it out by yourselves just from intuition. Now there's going to be that one kid in every lecture that says, all right, Clayton, I see what you did there, but prove it. Well, no problem. If you guys want the integration, the integration works out to be the same thing. If we know that our resultant force is going to be the integral of our distributed load over the beam, and we know that the W there is simply a constant, well, the integral is going to be W times X, and then evaluate it at X equals L and zero. Therefore, we get this, and then we can simplify it into simply W times L. So the math checks out as well. The thing to keep in mind is, this is a lot more steps. Remember, in the midterm or the final, we don't want to have a lot of steps. What we want is a nice, quick, easy solution. So I'd rather just find the area of a rectangle than to try and do some calculus. You, you look very big brain and smart, but it's just too much work, guys. Come on, we got to keep things simple. So at the end of the day, when you guys think of rectangular distributed loads, you need to know two things. The first one is the resultant force is simply going to be the distributed load multiplied by the length it acts over. And the centroid of it is simply going to be at the midpoint or L over two of the distributed load. So that one's nice and easy. And again, a real life scenario of distributed load would be something like people. People act as a nice distributed load. And if you guys go to the national building code, you guys will see that we actually treat people as simple uniformly distributed loads on our structures. Now the second kind of load that we're gonna talk about are triangular distributed loads. Now I got a little mis mistake here. I'm using rectangular, so I'll switch that to triangular. But triangular distributed loads are basically almost as complicated as it will get in terms of real life design. Of course, we can take things a step further and deal with quadratic and cubic distributed loads, but the reality is there aren't any. Now, you guys may be saying, all right, Clayton, well, if there aren't any, any of those, how is there triangular distributed loads? The best triangular distributed load is snow. Now, some of my American viewers may be saying, eh, what is that? Well, here in Canada, we have lots of it. Now, at the edge of high-rise buildings, they got something called a parapet. So here's the roof, and the edge of the building actually extends, extends upwards like this. And right in this area, the snow accumulates and goes upwards. So our snow profile would actually be triangular. So this is the case where we deal with these triangular distributed loads. And in terms of this course, these are as complex as they are going to get in terms of distributed loads. We'll talk about cubic and quadratic centroids later, but in terms of distributed loads, this will be as complicated as it gets. So what would this look like? Well, if I have my beam and it has length L, triangular distributed load can look something like this. Now, a function describing it could be W multiplied by X over L. So if I go X equals zero, well, my distributed load is zero, which would be the left-hand side. And if I go X equals L, well, L over L is one, so my distributed load is W over on the right-hand side. Now, what does this look like in terms of a, for a single force? Well, it's actually quite simple. It's going to be, again, the area of the distributed load. Now, we know that a triangle is simply one-half base times width. We know that the base is simply L and the height over there is going to be uh, <laughs> going to be W. I said base times width. That makes no sense. Base times height, of course. So we know that the distributed load in this case, or the point load it converts to, is going to be one half of W times L. Now the question becomes, where exactly does this act? Well, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's actually rather simple. This distributed load acts at a distance of one third from the corner of the highest part of the distributed load, or two thirds of the length from the point where it's zero, something like that. So this is going to be a triangular distributed load. Now, again, if you guys want the calculus, that's no problem. We can do our integration and integrate our distributed load function. At the end, we get one half W X squared divided by L. We evaluate it at the two points. We get one half W L. Nice and simple. We are looking pretty good. 
But as you guys can see, once the distributed load becomes more nonlinear, so in this case we went from constant to linear, and then the next step would be nonlinear, it starts to get really gross. And this is why we typically stop it here, because it gets really complex, but at the same time it's not really realistic. Again, triangular is about as complex as it gets in terms of distributed loading. Now for triangular loads, all you guys will have to remember is that the resultant force, again, the area of the distributed load, is one half of W times L, and it acts at a distance of L over three from the height of the distributed load. So the one thing that you guys have to remember, this L over three, it's on the higher side. That's that distance over there. It's not the distance from the left, it's from the higher point. If this distributed load was flipped and it starts off high and goes downwards, well then it's gonna be one third from this higher side, all right? So, but you guys can already picture that because you guys know what exactly this force is doing. All right, so that's actually it for distributed loads. It should be nice and simple. I'm hoping you guys look at this and say, oh yeah, Clayton, this is a piece of cake. That's great. And I got more good news. The next topic, support reactions, it's also really easy as well. Again, these are just kind of two fundamental things that we're going to talk about before we get into our actual structural analysis, which is going to begin with trusses, and then we're going to move on to beams and go even more complex from there. So yeah, that's it for this video. I hope I was able to cheer you guys up after that rough <laughs> video uh, or the previous video, which was the 3D force reduction. But don't worry, no more 3D moving forward. Uh, life is on easy street, at least until we get to friction. Again, friction is something students tend to hate quite a bit. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.